In the final step, let's consider multiple comparisons correction. Now, to illustrate what I mean by this and, and what the problem is, um, I wanted to briefly discuss this kind of fun study here that I believe was never really published. This is from a poster. Um, so the subject of the study was a mature Atlantic salmon and uh, he was not alive at the time of scanning, as the authors say here. So this is basically a dead salmon. Um, the authors gave the salmon a task to do. Basically, they put the salmon in the scanner and then showed different types of images, uh, photographs, depicting human individuals in social situations with a specific emotional valence. Um, and the salmon was asked to determine what emotion the individual in the photo must have been experiencing. So it's kind of like a theory of mind or an empathy task that the salmon was perform performing. Obviously, the salmon is dead, so he can't really do this. And even if he was alive, he couldn't do this um, because he probably wouldn't understand what the humans were doing or experiencing. Uh, this is the design and how the stimuli were presented to the dead salmon. And the analysis yielded uh, some interesting activations in the uh, salmon's brain. This is the salmon's brain. You can see that it's relatively small. And obviously, this cannot happen, right? So you can't have a dead salmon show activations in the brain. So the question then is, well, what's going wrong here, right? And what's going wrong is that the authors didn't correct for multiple comparisons, which early studies in uh, fMRI research did not do. So why is family-wise error rate a problem in um, fMRI research or specifically in fMRI research? Well, one of the reasons is that we repeat uh, the test 20,000 to 200,000 times. Let's just settle on 100,000 times here because it's easier to work with. If we then uh, adopt an alpha value threshold of 0.05, that means that out of those 100,000 voxels, 5,000 should show significant activation just by chance. And obviously that would be a problem, right? So we would then uh, make the false conclusion that in these 5,000 voxels, there's significant activation, although there shouldn't be, simply because we're setting our statistical threshold for accepting something uh, as significant at 0.05. Um, so it's a problem, especially because we have this massively univariate approach that we use in, in fMRI. But there are some solutions. One solution is the Bonferroni correction, uh, which is commonly used to correct for multiple comparisons, which is simply divide the alpha value that you accept, so 0 0.05, that's typical in many social sciences, and divide that by the number of tests that you perform, so by 100,000 in our example here. What would this mean? This would mean that we have a very low threshold um, that we would require for a given voxel to surpass, of a p-value threshold that the given voxel would have to surpass, which makes it almost impossible to obtain uh, any significant activations. So this means that Bonferroni is not a good solution um, in the context of fMRI uh, analyses, um, but it's a very good solution for, let's say, a smaller number of tests when they're conducted in uh, behavioral experiments. So here we want something uh, that does a better job um, at, at maintaining statistical power, which Bonferroni corrections uh, reduce quite a bit. Um, so we have two approaches here, and one is the false discovery rate, and the other one is the family-wise error correction that's resting on Gaussian random field theory, which mathematically is quite complex. It's quite easy to explain the false discovery rate, um, which basically calculates a new threshold based on ranking all the p-values from the smallest to the largest of all the tests that, that you've conducted. So 100,000 in our case. And then um, basically you can you can think of this as a visual inspection method. You then draw a line through all the ranked p-values. So you have a, a sort of non-normal distribution um, of p-values that, that you get. Uh, some of these p-values should show a significant effect, others shouldn't. Uh, and this, this effect should be a true positive. And you're basically cutting off all the p-values that fall be below a certain line that you estimate. And the line goes to the origin, so, so through 0, 0. Um, and it also has a slope that you can determine, and it's the slope of alpha divided by m, where alpha reflects the FDR correction threshold, and m reflects the number of tests conducted. 
So typical alpha here could be 0 0.05 again, right? And then M is the number of tests. And that gives you a line, uh, which you then, uh, well, that's the slope of the line, which then gives you a cutoff value. Anything that falls below this line, you take as significant, and anything that falls above this line, you reject as not significant. Family-wise error correction is a bit more complicated, and that, that depends really on the smoothness of the image that uh, you're getting um, at the final step. So basically, even before you apply uh, smoothing during the pre-processing steps, you already have a, an inherent smoothness within the image, and that is the important aspect uh, that SPM then estimates. And um, basically, if you have a certain smoothness within the image, that also implies that there's some space, spatial correlation among the different voxels. And this is what est SPM estimates, um, this type of spatial correlation. And it can then be used in multiple comparisons correction. Uh, so what SPM does using Gaussian, Gaussian random field theory then is to estimate the number of uncorrelated tests across the entire brain. And SPM calls this results based on the smoothness inherent in the image. Um, and given the spatial correlation, it's, it's kind of easy to imagine that the number of results should be smaller uh, than the number of voxels within the brain. This is uh, another output that SPM gives you. So family-wise error correction based on um, on this, this inherent smoothness within the image. And finally, we have cluster size thresholding, which is sort of a two-step procedure. So we have, let's say, um, an initial cluster forming threshold of 0 0.005. So each voxel has to surpass a p-value of 0 0.005, let's say, or 0 0.001. That's probably a better value, uh, as was shown in a recent paper. Um, and, and then you're saying, in addition to 0 0.001, I only accept as, as significant uh, if there's a certain number of voxels that, that cluster together. And this is based on the intuition that if you find significant activation within the brain, um, this should not be a single voxel, but especially when it's in cortex, it's multiple voxels next to each other that, that show this type of activation. When you perform a second level model in SPM, uh, then what you get is this kind of um, table here in addition to the image that's shown, um, as well as the design matrix of the second level model that you conducted. So let's have a closer look at the table. And there's a number of pieces of information in here that, that are important. Um, and note this is specifically an SPM output table. Other types of software give you different um, outputs. The first thing that we want to look at is this um, X, are the XYZ coordinates shown here at the very right. So these are the coordinates of the peak, uh, the peak voxel that activates within a given cluster. And you can actually click on this and as these, this red little arrow here will go to that location within the glass brain. And next to this then you see the peak level statistics. So these are statistics applied to the peak voxel. Um, so this is a voxel wise thresholding that, that we discussed earlier. You can see the T statistic for each voxel, the Z statistic, and you can see the uncorrected p-value. And it's easy to see that most of these here are uncorrected, right? So that's the p-value without before applying any kind of multiple comparisons correction to this um, to this voxel. And then you can see the output from FWE correction and FDR correction as well. And what's clearly seen here is that um, the output for the uncorrected voxel surpasses a threshold in many of these cases, while FWE correction and FDR correction does not do that, right? You can see that this would uh, be non-significant here, this voxel, and this one neither, whereas the first one uh, still is significant. Uh, and whereas the uncorrected value remains significant as well. And that's basically because we have so many uh, comparisons that we're conducting here. So this is peak level, but we can also have cluster level. And remember that um, cluster level means that we're basically requiring two things to occur. One is to for a voxel to surpass our set threshold. In this case, it was 0 0.001 uh, at the uncorrected level. And then the second thing is to also surpass a cluster level threshold. 
um, which we have to determine based on the type of method of uh, multiple comparisons that we're using here. Um, in this case, uh, we do not surpass statistical significance if it's um, about 40 voxels, but we do when it's 80 voxels. So the threshold will fall somewhere in between these two here. So we're saying that in addition to surpassing 0 0.001 uh, at the individual voxel level, we're also requiring a certain number of voxels to be adjacent to each other to say that, well, this cluster shows a significant um, uh, effect, basically. The number of clusters can be identified down here. Uh, and this is what this is showing us. So it has to be actually 84 voxels uh, for it to be significant in, in this current analysis here. So once we surpass 84 voxels, we can say that this is significant. Uh, anything below 84 voxels, no matter what multiple comparisons correction approach we apply to this two-step thresholding procedure uh, would then um, be called non-significant in this case. So as you can see, there's basically three, well, there's more than three pieces, but you could categorize this um, output um, table that we're getting from SPM into three different levels. We could get, we, we have the uh, coordinates of the peak uh, voxel that shows significant activations at the uncorrected threshold here. Then we have the uh, corrected thresholds at the peak level, and we have the corrected thresholds at the cluster level. Um, and in a typical analysis, what is what what might be used are the FWE corrected cluster level um, significances here or statistics that are shown in this in this column here. Finally, another way to reduce the number of comparisons that we're conducting is by restricting your analyses to what's called an ROI or the a region of interest. So this basically means that you're not looking at the entire brain, but you're now looking at a specific area within the brain that obviously has a lower number of voxels, which you then also um, need to correct for, but it's a lower number than the entire brain, maybe in the, in the order of hundreds of voxels rather than 100,000 uh, voxels. A very important aspect here is that you start with a neuroanatomical hypothesis before the experiment starts. So you specify your regions of interest uh, and, and the regions that you limit your analyses to before the experiment. These could be based on previous studies in your field that look at a similar, um, well, cognition or affective process that, that, that you are studying in your study. So let's say you're interested in fear, and it makes a lot of sense then in that case to look at, for instance, the amygdala, because that's been shown to be implicated in a similar task in previous studies. You can also use findings from meta-analyses and a meta-analysis that you should be uh, familiar with now should be the Batra et al. paper that basically identifies the valuation system across over 200 studies in neuroeconomics. Another way to define your ROIs uh, might be based on a meta-analysis extracted from neurosynth.org. There are a number of ROI approaches that you can use. One is to simply take the average signal extracted from your region of interest and then um, do this in two different conditions. So let's say in your treatment condition, you get the signal uh, from, the, from the average ROI and you do the same for the control condition. And then you compare the um, effects outside of uh, SPM using other type of software that, that allows you to do statistical analyses. Uh, and this, in this case, it would be a simple t-test looking at control versus treatment. Is the activation larger in one versus the other condition? But you can also perform RI analyses within SPM using what's called small volume correction. And this is basically doing what I mentioned earlier. Namely, it's restricting the analyses, doing um, a, a multiple comparisons correction, but based on the number of voxels within your region of interest and not the entire number of, of voxels. Uh, within the entire within the entire brain, so that obviously gives you a little bit of increased statistical detection power. But again, here it's very important that you identify uh, and name your regions of interest uh, before the start of the experiment. So for your final projects, you might conduct RI analyses, and you might extract data from SPM. There's two ways of doing this. One is via the eigenvariate button 
which you can find here. So once you click on a certain region, you can then click on the Eigenvariate button and define your region of interest. It could, for instance, be a sphere with a radius of six millimeters, um, which basically draws a sort of sphere around this region, uh, around the uh, peak voxel, and it gives you a eigenvariate, so a, a um, um, activation per subject within your data set. And that's what's shown here. So um, this is showing the uh, subjects that were included in the study. So it was over 40 in the study and each one gets a, um, a specific value. You can extract this then from your command window. Um, so there's a variable that is saved into the um, MATLAB workspace and you can extract the, the data for each participant from your command window and then plot this in, in many different ways. There's also a toolbox that you might use, um, which allows you to extract data from SPM. For instance, RFX plots, um, which is a nice toolbox that uh, then gives you the average value within within this uh, region of interest. So averaged across all the voxels within the region of interest um, that can be defined by either the significant voxels that activate in the group map or again via a sphere that you that you might extract um, that you can define here uh, with a given radius.